new life in a family. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Hmm. Now, a little later on today, after the service, we're going to have a baptism. <clears throat> There's a couple of ordinances that the Lord left for his church. One is baptism, and the other one is what we're going to be doing Wednesday night, which is communion. Communion. So neither baptism nor infant dedication or communion are salvific. They don't save you, do they? No, no, no. They're all signs. They're signs and symbols, okay? Baptism happens subsequent to faith. After you believe in the Lord, now you want the whole world to know that you belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to you. That's the whole purpose for baptism. And so that's what these folks are going to declare this afternoon, right after our service. So I want to encourage everyone to join us out back for the baptism. And I hope you could stay for lunch, but if you can, at least join us to be a witness of these who are going to be baptized, to declare to the world that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, that they love him, and he loves them, that he is in them, and, he, and they are in him. Amen? So baptism is a sign. It's an outward sign of an inward change that has taken place in the life of the believer. It's telling the world that you're now a follower of Jesus. We have lots of fans of Jesus, not too many followers, but you want to be followers, don't you? Because the shepherd has called his sheep by name, and he says, come, follow me. That's right, follow me. And so we want to follow him. So baptism is not salvific. Communion doesn't save you. Communion is a sign, isn't it? We don't believe that the, the wine, and we don't use wine, we use grape juice. But we don't believe that the grape juice becomes his blood. We don't believe that the host becomes the bread, the matzah becomes his body, do we? No, we're not re-crucifying Christ over and over and over again, as in some beliefs, erroneous. It's a sign. It's a symbol of what Jesus has done on our behalf, right? Baptism, communion, dedication of our children, all a sign. Amen? Yeah. Now, if you turn me to Romans 6, let me explain to you what baptism is about. Briefly. That's possible for me. Several of the fellows went on a uh, men's conference yesterday up in Nashville. We had a wonderful time, didn't we? During the Q&A, one question was asked about someone who had a, um, uh, an addictive sin problem. And there's no better answer than what we find right here in Romans chapter 6 to whatever it is you might be struggling with. You know. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I've been walking with the Lord for 40 years. I only have three sins left to deal with. <laughs> the pride of life. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. Everything else I got covered. You know? <laughs> but, but that's true for all of us, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Now, you can be free of those chains. You can be free of those things that might be plaguing you, besetting sins, we call them, by focusing on the shepherd, by focusing on the, she the, uh, the, <laughs> the shepherd of the sheep, Jesus. And you'll be free of those chains. Now, if you focus on your problem, what's going to happen? It gets worse. You get depressed, despondent, and despair. Why? Because the flesh will never conquer over the flesh. Will it? No, never. But focus it upon Jesus. And we can conquer over everything that plagues us in the flesh. And, and basically, that's what our baptism describes. It's a sign to the world. Look at chapter 6 of Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? No, certainly not. Perish the thought. Never. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Verse 3 of chapter 6 of Romans. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death? So your baptism is a symbol that you identify with the death of Christ upon the cross, that he died on your behalf. He did for you what you could never, ever, 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 ever have done for yourself. Why? Because all have sinned. Since the very beginning, we come into this world with a sin nature. Why don't we baptize infants? Because first of all, it says you must believe, repent, and be baptized, right? So if you show me an infant who can articulate what they believe, and that they need to repent of screaming in their crib, waiting to be changed or fed, you know, <laughs> then I'll baptize them. But, but that screaming child demanding that their needs be met is a symbol, a sign of the sin nature that's in all of us, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God has come on our behalf to live a perfectly sin-free life. 
He's the only one. Don't look for perfection anywhere else. If you're looking for the perfect church, stay out of it. You'll ruin it. <laughs> there isn't one. If you're looking for the perfect pastor, he ain't here. <laughs> but there is a perfect shepherd of the flock. There's a perfect Lord. There's a perfect Savior. There's the perfect Messiah who has lived a perfectly sin-free life, tempted in every way that we are, but he was without sin. Do you understand that? Even Mary, his mother, in her Magnifica said she needed him as her Savior, for she sinned as well, didn't she? The sin nature. Now, now, sinning doesn't make us a sinner. We sin because we are sinners. I use the expression of my dog. My dog barking make him a dog? No, he barks because he is a dog. It's his nature. And so ours too. But we conquer over that sinful nature and the consequence of our sin through faith in Jesus Christ by believing in your heart. heart. Do you not know that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we who were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. Wow, that's quite, a, quite an amazing thing that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, wasn't it? And how did he raise from the dead? By what power? By the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called the dudamus, dynamite power. <laughs> the dudamus of God rose Jesus from the dead. Do you know? Listen to me. Do you know that same dudamus power, that same dynamite power resides within you who believe? If you believe in your that the Holy Spirit changes everything, doesn't he? Yeah. 40 years ago when I came to the Lord, he has changed every, continuing to change every. Now, it doesn't happen all at once because if it happened all at once, what would happen? The shock will kill you, Jackson. <laughs> if he changed all of you at once, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself, would you? No. But it's a progressive sanctification that's taking place. Where every day and in every way, Jesus Christ is becoming more and more the master of my life, the center of all that I am, and more and more manifest that I become more and more Christ-like. It's a process. Justification happens immediately. Boom. You're justified, declared righteous. Why? Because of your faith in Christ. Not because of anything you've done. Because you believe in your heart what Jesus has done for you. That he did live that perfectly sin-free life. That he was crucified, died, and was buried. Oh, but he didn't stay in the grave, did he? No, three days later, he arose from the grave and ascended unto the Father and said, hey, I'm coming back. Hey, we're going to get some T-shirts printed up. It's going to say, normal isn't coming back, but Jesus is. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we walk in the newness of life. So we have that dunamite power, that dunamis power, the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in a new life. We don't have to be bound by those chains, by those sins any longer. Now, you, you can choose to participate and you render yourself ineffective for the Lord, but you can choose to follow Jesus and tap into his power, his life, allowing it to live through him to live through you to where you conquer over those sins. And that's what he's going to talk about next. Verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also in the likeness of his resurrection. Walking in the newness of life, being a new man or woman, following the Lord, walking in his ways, no longer mastered by our flesh. You know, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, materialism, pleasures, pride. We can conquer of all of that through his power. Hmm? Knowing this, verse 6. That the old man was crucified with him. Hallelujah. Are you, aren't you glad about that? That the old man was crucified with Christ upon the cross? Hmm? Now you need to reckon him dead. He, he tries to resurrect himself. You know the problem with living sacrifices? They try to crawl off the altar, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't ever want to go back and act like that old man who has been crucified with Christ. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now, the reality is you're going to be a slave. A doulos, hopefully, of Christ. 
or you're a slave to sin. But every, listen to me, no one's free, truly, truly, truly free. You're either mastered by your flesh and the desires of your flesh, which we call sin, or Christ is your master and you're a slave to Christ, a doulos to Christ. Now, now, being a slave to a benevolent, loving, wonderful, gracious, forgiving, long-suffering, patient master is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Uh, some of you were here when my son came with his dog storm and did that presentation, how we're to follow the master. Well, he did it again yesterday uh, for all of the men at the men's conference there in Asheville. And, and it's just a wonderful example that, that that dog loves and adores and follows my son. My son is his master. The dog responds to all of his o- commands most often in obedience. You know Why? Because he has a loving, benevolent, gracious master. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Now, when God exposes his love to you, it is irresistible. When you truly come to experience through knowing through experience the love of God that he has for you, you can't run from it. You don't want to hide from it. You don't want to resist it. No one ever, ever will love you as God does. I love being married. I I told the fellas yesterday, I always tell you, live life out of where? Out of your heart. Live life out of your heart. Why? I can safely say that to you because Christ dwells within your heart. And so when you live life out of your heart, you're allowing Christ to live his life through you. But I recognize that my love for you is very limited. And some of it is conditional. I have an expectation. I have some desires and things I want met, right? But if I allow Christ to love through me, unconditionally, sacrificially, that becomes so attractive, doesn't it? And I don't expect anything from you. I don't ask anything from you, but it's all about what I can give to you and vice versa. That's when marriage becomes heaven on earth. Do you understand? And when you see and experience that unconditional, sacrificial love of Jesus for your life, nothing else can satisfy. Nothing else can compare. Isn't that true? And I have to say, I see it displayed in so many of the couples in our chapel family here. Verse 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we also believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. How many times? Did he need to be crucified? How many times did Moses need to smote the rock? Once, once. The second time, speak to the rock, right? So he's been smitten, crucified. And now all you have to do is invite him into your heart and your life. And let me tell you something, everything will change. Not all at once, but everything will begin to change. Hmm? For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, verse 11, now this is what's important. Set your mind on it. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, dead men men have fleshly appetites? I've been to a lot of funerals. I've never seen a dead man raise up and say, look, one more cigarette and one more drink. Hey, hey, just one more party. Dead men are dead to the things of the flesh, aren't they? They're dead to the things of this world. And when you allow yourself to truly find your identification in Christ Jesus, you become dead to those things and those passions of the world and alive to the things of God, to that which is truly beautiful, to true love. Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. This is indicative that you have a choice now. You see, before before you were a slave to sin, you had no choice. You had to obey the appetites of your flesh. 
When those appetites were excited, when those appetites wanted to be fed and satisfied, you had no choice but to satisfy them, didn't you? True, isn't it? Yeah. All my wife has to say is, you know, I was going to buy you some ice cream today. You were going to? <laughs> and then I have to tell you, the rest of the afternoon, and before long, I'm in my car, and what do you think I'm going to get? <laughs> Which she didn't buy me. You know? Now, had she not said anything, you know, it might have slipped my mind, probably not, but it might have, you know. <laughs> Listen, indicative here is you have a choice now. You can choose to put your focus on Christ and things above and spiritual things and true love and giving yourself away to others so that they would see the beauty and the love and the compassion, the long-suffering of Jesus. Or you can choose to enjoy the pleasures of flesh for a season. You're free now. You're free to serve the Master. And the rewards are indescribable. Or you're free once again to try to indulge your flesh where there is no profit, no future. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. Verse 13, do not present your members as instruments of righteousness, unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace. You see, the law simply showed us what sinners we were. You know how it works. Don't touch wet paint. What do you do? I wonder if it's true. You know, stay off the grass. You know, 55. <laughs> All the law does is show you that you're a lawbreaker, right? <laughs> and you're, you're in need of a power that's not innate with you, that's outside of you to obey the law. And what law do we want to obey more than any other? The law of the Spirit, which is love. Love. I don't think I'm going to get to my message this morning because this wasn't it. <laughs> but I, listen, here's what I want to explain to you. Do not forfeit the power that you have within you to love in such a way that it'll change other people's lives. It'll change your life for sure. But in the process, it's going to change other people's lives. For goodness sakes, I'm in my 70s, and I'm just learning that it's love. It's love. It's love and the power of love that wins over everything. You understand? So now that you have the Holy Spirit in you, now that you have the person of Christ, now that you have the love of God dwelling within you, you have a tremendous potential to share that love with others. Even to love your enemies. Wow. Wow. Hey, let's just practice loving one another. <laughs> then we'll get to our enemies, okay? <laughs> Where's the most difficult arena of life to love in? Family, marriage, right? Yeah, yeah. You think you got it down? You single people, go get married. <laughs> then come talk to me. So our baptism, the baptism that's going to take place in a little while with these four, it's just an outward sign of the fact that love has entered into their heart and life. The love of God which surpasses all understanding. It can't be understood, but it can be experienced. Can it? Yeah. So when we baptize them later on, we're going to celebrate with them and rejoice with them. We're going to pray for them. Why? Because right after they come out of the water and they start going back out into the world, who wants to meet up with them? Satan. The enemy, of course. Yeah, yeah. The world, the flesh, the devil, that's our enemy. They work in concert to try to rob us of the riches of the life that we can live now, a life of love in Christ. Wow. And, 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 and all of the relationships of life, 
whether it's a husband and wife, a mother and child, a father and son, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all of them reach their highest and fullest potential in Jesus. Jesus considers us his family. We are the body of Christ, the family of God, aren't we? Mm. Can I pray again, please? Father, I just thank you so much, Lord. Lord, we can't even describe the love that Glory and Brandon and the family have for this little baby, for Nolan. Lord, the love that we have for our children as parents, as grandparents, Lord. It, it, it is unexplainable, but Lord, it's, it's so deep. It is so powerful. It is so giving and sacrificial. But Lord, it is nothing in comparison to your love for us, Lord. Lord, I sat down one day and I started to, to meditate, to contemplate this love. And Lord, I love my son. I love my wife. But Lord, my love for my son and my love for my wife is, com is compared to your love for them is hatred. It, there's, no, there's not even a comparison, Lord. As I understand, have grown to understand and experience your love. There's no greater power in all of earth, all of heaven or earth, Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, the lover of our soul. And so, Lord, may Nolan just grow and be nurtured and mature in this love. <laughs> and, Lord, for those who are going to be baptized this afternoon, for Micah and Levi, Gigi and Anna, Lord, just declaring to this congregation, to the world, that they have allowed your love to enter into their hearts and lives, Lord. That love of salvation, that rescue, rescue from ourselves, rescue from our flesh, rescue from our selfishness. To live a life that is Christ-centered, others-centered, Lord. Empower them to do that. And Lord, bring us back to the time when we were baptized, when we declared to the world our love for you, that you are ours and we are yours. And Lord, renew within us the desire to set you free to love others through us, Lord. And to love our enemies, Lord. To love the unlovable. And this morning, I just want to lift up a special prayer for Nikki. As the doctors are removing her bandages this morning. And for the first time, she's really going to see what has happened. But Lord, I pray that she sees well beyond the damage of her flesh, the scars, the deformity. But Lord, she would look to you and recognize that her identity is in you, Lord, and the beauty is way beyond the skin. It's deep within the heart, Lord. And I pray that you'll give her such a soundness of mind, Lord, such a confidence in her relationship with you, Lord, that none of this would shake her, Lord. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit just wrap yourself and your love and your assurance, Lord, around her mind and her heart right now. Be with her, Lord. Lord, I live with a woman. I know what it's like when she has a bad heart, hair day. <laughs> Lord, we do intercede, all of us, right now on behalf of Nikki, Lord. Be there in that room right now. Be present in her mind and her heart, Lord, and do not shake her confidence in your love, that great love for her. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. And everyone who agrees said, Amen. 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 Well, I've got a few minutes, so we'll broach John chapter 10, because that's where we are this morning. And John chapter 10 is really a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. Jesus makes seven I am statements about himself. Remember, the Gospel of John was written to prove what? The deity of Jesus Christ, right. The gospel of John was written to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was God. 
because there was some doubt in that. And unfortunately, that doubt even exists to this very day, where some people believe that Jesus was a man who represented God, but that he wasn't God himself. John wrote the gospel to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus was in fact God, not only by the statements he made doctrinally, theologically, but by the things that he declared that Jesus did. He picked seven very specific miracles that Jesus performed that showed his power over nature, over life and death, over disease, that he was the Lord of heaven and earth, omnipotent, all-powerful, right? Well, here we come to this place where we, he, he makes seven I am statements about himself declaring his deity. We've already covered two of them. This is the third. What were the first two? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Those are the first two. I am the bread of life. He fed 5,000 people with five little barley loaves and two fish. How did that happen? <laughs> the power of God. He found 5,000 men, specifically, besides women and children, so they believed the crowd that he fed that day was well over 20,000, showing his power over nature, over physical laws. What was the second miracle, the second I am statement? I am the light of the world. And we went back to the beginning of Genesis. In the first three verses of the first chapter of Genesis, you have the Trinity, right? Right? Elohim, God, Elohim, in the beginning, bara, created the heaven and the earth, right? Bara means created from nothing. That Hebrew word means he created without any pre-existing materials. He just spoke it into existence. You didn't recognize how powerful our God really is. That's the God that loves you. That's the God whose power is limitless in caring for you, providing for you. And then it says, and the Spirit of God hovered over the darkness and the deep in the beginning of creation. So we see the Holy Spirit there. God, the Father, Bara, the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and then he brought forth the light. And he said, light be, literally two words in Hebrew, light be. Boof. That was before the sun, the moon, and stars were created. Well, who was that light? Jesus, right from the very beginning, the Trinity. Elohim. Elohim is a name for God, which is a compound unity. El is singular. Elah, E-L-A-H, is dual form. Elohim, three or more. Compound unity. The Father, the Spirit, the Son as the light of the world. Now, when he says, I am the I am, what is he representing? What is it symbolic of? The tetragrammaton. What's a tetragrammaton? The Hebrew four-letter name for God, which the Jews won't even try to pronounce, right? Because they, they revere God in his name so much. When they refer to God, what do they say? Hashem. Simply Hashem, the name, for fear they would mispronounce the name of God. Now he's going to say, I am, did you read ahead? The good shepherd. The good, this, this analogy, this metaphor of the shepherd and the sheep, it's throughout the Bible, isn't it? Who were some of the earliest shepherds in the Bible? Abraham, David, Isaac, Jacob. Yeah. And so throughout the Bible, God is referred to as the shepherd Israel, his people in the Old Testament as the sheep. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus is the shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd spoken of in Hebrews, right? The chief shepherd that First Peter talks about of the flock. And who might the flock be? You, you. It's Jew and Gentile. But you see, that shepherd analogy that was used quite often among the leaders in the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, the kings were considered the shepherds of the people, the priests, the shepherds, and some of the prophets were even called the, the, the shepherds of the flock. But how many misrepresented God? How many false prophets have come then and since, right? How many selfish kings? How many good kings were there in the northern kingdom of Israel? No. Zero. Zero. In all of the southern kingdom, how many good kings? And how many reformers? Oh, you're so smart. But so often, there were so many false prophets. Jeremiah came against them all, and they murdered him. So many selfish kings, and all these kings wanted to do. What, you know, aren't we glad we don't have political leaders any longer that just live for themselves and enrich themselves? <laughs> and then the plurality of false messiahs. Oh, boy. Even in our contemporary period. 
How many false messiahs were there? Have there been? Even today, today, there are men who claim to be messiah and, and gullible people who are following them, not knowing the word of God. Jesus comes into this scene. When we finish chapter 9, what miracle did he perform? Yeah, the light of the world brought light to a man who was born blind. And after he received his sight and he was giving glory to God and to this man who he didn't know specifically yet, what did the religious leadership do? Excommunicated him. No, listen, nothing could be worse for an individual than to be excommunicated. You know, that was the power of the Inquisition during the period of Romanism in the Spanish Inquisition. They, they would excommunicate people. They would torture you to confess to something, right? Oh, just like so many of these false teachers do the word of God. They torture it till it confesses anything. They so misinterpret the scriptures. Not applying the science of hermeneutics, the proper way of interpreting scripture to the text but they do such violence to the text, it'll confess to anything. Well, the same thing will happen during the Inquisition. You torture someone long enough and more painfully enough, they'll confess to anything, won't they? And then they would murder these people. Excommunication was the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Why? Because you were damned forever, they believed. Can you imagine some man, some institution, some system having the power to damn you forever? Hell, eternal damnation. Who was that created for? Satan and his demons. It was never created for man. Poneurology, you know what that is? Poneurology? Harmatology, you know what that is? Harmatology is the study of sin. Poneurology is the study of evil. Where did evil begin? Satan and his demons. That's where evil began. That's why God created hell. Eternal damnation, not for man. It was never, ever, ever created for Nolan. It was never created for that baby. Evil. The study of evil began with Satan. The study of sin began with men in the fall. When we were tempted. And God could have scrubbed the whole place. Started all over. But he loves you so much, he wouldn't live without you. And he sent Jesus to be the savior of your soul. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm. False prophets, selfish kings, false messiahs. And so what Jesus is going to do here, he's going to seek out that one who was excommunicated, who, who erroneously would have believed and would have been taught that he is damned now forever because he's been excommunicated by these these religious leaders, these Pharisees, these judgmental, legalistic, hard-hearted legalists, violating the law of God, the law of the Spirit, which is love. Love. So Jesus seeks this man out. Remember the end of chapter 9? Jesus finds him. Who was lost, you or Jesus? You. <laughs> you didn't find Jesus. Jesus... Jesus is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 and 9 to seek out the... And then he calls that one by name. That's exactly what he did for you, didn't he? Hey, I didn't find Jesus. Jesus found me. Like the old country preacher said, I did all the sinning and the running, and Jesus did all the saving and the chasing. <laughs> yeah. But if you turn with Ezekiel chapter 34 for a minute, And we're just going to scratch the surface of our text this morning in chapter 10. But the background of that and the fulfillment of Ezekiel 34 is what we're seeing, is what is taking place here in chapter 10. So many... Uh, I said chapter 34 of Ezekiel... So many contemporary teachers, uh, I don't even, they're not even teachers, contemporary cheerleaders, motivational speakers are encouraging the church to unhitch or disconnect the Old Testament from the New and they just focus on what they believe is the uh, 
reinvention of Christianity or the real Jesus. You, you know, you tell your children not to stick anything into the light socket, right? Because they, they're going to get hurt. And if I tell Gail to plug an appliance into the outlet, she knows she needs to do that in order for the appliance to function. If I say, well, I read something that says you need a 110 outlet or a 220 outlet, okay, I can understand that. That's what I need to plug this into. But I really can't understand electrical theory until I study electrical theory, right? And then I can really have an understanding of it, and I can begin to really understand electrical circuitry and, and, and start to be able to work with it far more effectively, right? Well... When you disconnect the Old Testament from the New and all you have is the New, you know, you just know where you need to plug in the appliance. We really don't understand why it works that way. You understand? And that's how much they're missing. Goodness, goodness, goodness. So in order to understand what Jesus is declaring here in chapter 10 of John's Gospel, you need to have some understanding of God's condemnation of the false shepherds in the Old Testament and the promise of the new, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the, the great shepherd who would be coming. And that's what you see here in Ezekiel 34. So look with me there in the time remaining. Do you have a heading over verse uh, 1 of chapter 34, anyone? What you all said. One at a time. The false shepherd. Somebody else. Irresponsible, Irresponsible shepherd. shepherd. Prophecy, against the shepherd. Prophecy against these false. Now listen, today we have a plethora of false teachers and false shepherds and false prophets. Just get on YouTube. And, and, and listen, how, how do you know when you have a wolf or a wolfette among the sheep? The sheep start missing. Because whether it's a male wolf or a female wolf, they have an appetite for lamb chops, sheep. And so when you have a wolf or a wolfette in your midst, you will see that very soon sheep begin to show up missing. Hmm. There's only one shepherd of the flock, right? There's only one flock and one shepherd. Who's that shepherd? Now, every good shepherd needs a Sheepdog. That's what I am. <laughs> so, irresponsible shepherds, false shepherds. Chapter 34, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, the God, of the, to, God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? The responsibility of any good pastor is to feed the flock, not to fleece the flock. And so these shepherds, these false shepherds, these religious leaders within Israel, even to our very present day, all they're really concerned about is enriching themselves. Who's the richest evangelist in the world right now? Kenneth Copeland. The guy is demonic. If you've ever seen him or watched him on television, I mean, the, the, the guy, there's something seriously wrong with this man who's worth almost a billion dollars. It's insane. And why are there so many people who follow them? Because they're so gullible, they don't know the word of God for themselves, and, and all this man tempts them with is the desires of their flesh. He doesn't motivate them spiritually, doesn't inspire them and stir them spiritually. And the harm and the pain and the suffering that these false teachers, these false prophets have put upon the people of God, fleecing the flock of God rather than feeding the flock of God. And then they come in and, and, and they really are truly seeking the Lord. And then they get so hurt emotionally, spiritually, sometimes physically. Oh, fellas, yesterday morning I, I was privileged to share the first study and my task was to explain how a man of metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, courage, conviction, resolve, constitution, a, um, a man of purpose would handle the word of God, putting the word in the heart. And, and it's, not, it's, not the, it's not the word, the Bible in your heart as much as the word, Jesus Christ himself in your heart. You, you can have the, listen, there are a lot of people who have volumes of the scriptures memorized, but their hearts are black, wicked. I gave several examples yesterday 
of prominent men who have a national platform who have fallen so far. Why? Because their hearts were exposed. And how many of the flock had been damaged? The abuse in the church that has happened with children, with, with women in the church, abuse of the finances of the church. I mean, just it, these, they have done such harm and in some cases, irreparable harm. And people go out so disillusioned and believe that that's, that's, that's Christianity? That's Jesus? No. No. Don't let some perversion distort your view, your experience, your understanding, your coming to the true Jesus, the real Jesus, not this fake Jesus of the contemporary world we live in. They call the Christianity of today uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic because everybody thinks they're a good poison. You know, even the soft sell on the, on the gender confusion today. Therapeutic because, hey, it's all about making me feel good, isn't it? Making me feel good about me? No, not making you feel good. God wants to make you actually be good. <laughs> There's a difference, right? And then the deism is... All gods are acceptable. All God, they're tolerant of every and all gods. All roads lead to God. Is that true? No, no, no. But that's what we have today. We have, we have a Christian that is rotting from the inside out. Why? Because of the false teachers, the false prophets. Why? All they want to do is enrich themselves. They're trying to present an environment that's acceptable to everyone so that they can get a little piece of everyone, Right? not caring for the flock. Very, very large church here in town. New Year's celebration. Singles, spectacular. Inviting all the singles of the community to come to their spectacular. Their New Year's celebration. Before I was saved, I would have thought, wow, the wolf that I was? And they're opening up the entrance to the flock? To me, think about it. Think about if you're going to have a singles celebration for New Year's and you're going to invite every single in the community. Are you out of your mind? That's not a shepherd. That's a hireling. That's a false shepherd. This is what Jesus is coming down on. The weak you have not strengthened, verse 4, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back those that were driven away, nor sought that which was lost, but with force and cruelty you have you ruled them. And that's what they do. Speaking of one man who had a national platform, a, a, a worldwide ministry. I mean, he's fallen because of his narcissistic, egotistical abuse of the people, the staff, the people in the church, and his appropriate use of finances. And, and the, guy, the guy's a great teacher. He's got a black heart. His heart was for himself. And so they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all of the beasts of the field. And they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all of the mountain on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth. And no one was seeking nor searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my she shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not... Feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, and they shall no longer be food for them. That's all they see them as. A means for gain. Manipulating them. Emotionally stirring them. See how they could use them and abuse them. Then he talks about 
God is going to provide. Now, now this is yet to come. This, this, is, this is precisely what we see in chapter 10, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that great, good chief shepherd that God is going to provide for his people. Verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among the scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all of the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and a dark day. Hmm, what's that cloudy and dark day? In your leisure, go read Joel chapter 2. It's the day of the Lord. When did the day of the Lord begin? The day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. Now the Lord is Jesus Christ. And the day of the Lord is when God is going to actually physically, literally gather together the flock of Israel once again. He's gathering his flock, the church, right now. But in that day, he's going to awaken Israel to who he is. He's going to gather Israel back to himself. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, verse 13. And I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in all of the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them, verse 14, in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. <laughs> Jesus began that process. Its completion will be during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Jesus came first for the lost house of Israel, for the scattered sheep of God. You understand? But God purposed the rejection of the Messiah by Israel for the sake of the salvation of you, Gentiles. If Israel had accepted Jesus as their Messiah when he first came almost 2,000 years ago, where would we be? Out, lost. Someone asked me this morning, Nicole, she said, how long has this church been here? And I said, about 2,000 years now. <laughs> but we're leaving soon. <laughs> yes, on a cloud, cloudy and dark day. I will bring them out from the peoples. Verse 15, I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. And I will seek what was lost and bring back that which was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen that was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in the judgment. Those false shepherds who were preying upon the people. As for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, verse 17, behold, I shall judge between the sheep and sheep and between rams and goats. Nothing worse than when someone who claims to be a believer takes advantage of other believers. George Soros. Anybody know the name? George Soros. What's his ethnicity? He's a Jew. How did he make all his money? Betraying his own people. His father and he, particularly his father, began it, confiscating all of the Jewish wealth during the reign of the Nazi regime. They collaborated, his father and he collaborated with the Nazis on the confiscation of all of the wealth and the property and the art treasures of the Jews there in Germany. That's how they gained their wealth. That's how he got all his money. Now there's a special place in Gahana for him who would betray his own. That's what he's talking about here. I will judge between sheep and sheep. Those, those of the flock of Israel who are Israel and the goats. Verse 18 is it, too little for you, is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of our pasture and to have drunk all of the clear waters that you must follow the residue with your feet? They were taking advantage of the flock, destroying the flock, pouncing upon the flock, taking all that was good and leaving them the crumbs that were behind and a polluted water to drink. But as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet, and they will drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with the side and the shoulder, butted with the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. How is all these politicians have become so wealthy? How is it all of them suddenly overnight have become such friends with the Chinese? 
universities, secretly taking funds from the Chinese and not disclosing it to the government at all. University researchers and professors selling these secrets to the Chinese. Businesses now in bed with the Chinese. Why is it these high-tech moguls don't say anything about the oppression of people in China, yet they work in concert with the Chinese, helping the Chinese in the latest technologies for their military endeavors? Academia, business, government, what about sports? Who's the NBA be holding to now? China. Is that not unbelievable? Hmm. And the rich seem to get richer, and the evil seem to celebrate in their evil. But let me tell you, listen to me, listen to me. What we're reading here and what we know to be true, every devil gets their due. Make no mistake about it. And every saint a reward. Why? Because like Juliana this morning, we play music for the Lord, don't we? Yeah. We live our life for the Lord now, not for riches, not for filthy lucre, right? But to be pleasing to the Lord. And one day, do not grow weary in doing good. Why? Paul said, in due season you will reap your reward. But it's not here, it's there. It's there. That's what he's promising us now. I must finish quickly. Verse 22, therefore I will save my flock and they shall no longer be prey and I will judge between the sheep and the sheep and I will establish one shepherd over them and they will feed them. My servant David's been dead. Who's the shepherd he's talking about? Jesus, the descendant of David. And he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness, sleep in the woods. And I will make them, the places all around, my hill, a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season, and there shall be showers of blessing, the former and the latter rains which have returned in our day. Wow. God is going to be the shepherd of his flock in caring for them, not just the Jew, not just Israel. This, this goes way out into the period that we're in right now in John chapter 10 where Jesus is the shepherd of the flock, the great shepherd. There's only one flock, one Lord, one shepherd, one baptism, one faith, one hope. Isn't that true? Yeah. And no one has to be outside of that circle of love. No one. You choose to be. All you have to do is receive the gift of God in the person of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins to be redeemed. Redeemed from the marketplace of sin. Redeemed from, from the destiny of eternal damnation. And now purchased of God and become his flock, his child. Just like little Nolan in your care for a little while. But our prayer is that he gives his heart one day to the chief shepherd. Or maybe even better yet, the chief shepherd comes before he reaches that age. <laughs> Finish the chapter and we'll end here. And then the trees of the fields shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in the land. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. <sighs> yeah, to some extent, these young people are right. The capitalism has economically enslaved a lot of people. Yes, it enriches those who are aggressive and those who work hard to some extent, but there's a lot of inequity as well, isn't there? You, you can be born into privilege. The most entitled, the grossest display of an entitlement family on the face of the earth is who? The monarchs and kings and queens of England. <laughs> that's, that's the grossest display of an entitlement family. <laughs> How fair is that if you were an Englishman born in poverty, but you had this blue blood born in wealth, opulence, privilege, you know. 
So there is some argument to the fact that there is an inequality, isn't there? Now, I do believe in hard work. You work hard, and it'll pay off for you in the long run. But, but believe me, God has not brought about the economic system that we're in today. This is not his system. When he has his way, it's going to be a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> it, it's, it's, listen to me. Don't misunderstand me. It's going to be communism in its purest form. You understand? All equally sharing in the labor and the blessings. This is what he's indicating here. And they shall no longer be a prey for the nations, verse 28, nor shall beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely and no one shall make them afraid. I will raise up for them a garden of renown, and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Anti-Semitism is going to reach a feverish pitch once again, and the worst is yet to come for God's people, if you read your scripture. But this is what he promises at the end of all of that, during the millennial reign. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, I am your God, says the Lord God. Hmm. That's his promise to Israel. John chapter 10, we see this promise being, beginning to be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, the one true shepherd, the good shepherd, the chief, chief shepherd. My question to you is this. It was 19... I don't remember the year. I was in Belize. You know the country of Belize? Anybody know where Belize is? Belize, uh, they're English-speaking. It was an English colony at one point. I was in a church in Belize worshiping. And this older man, this Belizean, come up to me after the service. He wanted to introduce himself. He was speaking in that, that Belizean, uh, Jamaican uh, kind of an accent. And he says, man, man, let me ask you one question, man. You know the 23rd Psalm? Oh, yeah, I know the 23rd Psalm. Now let me ask you another question, man. Do you know the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm? I said, yes, I do. No, man, no. I'm asking you, not here, man, but here. Do you know the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm, man? And he was very serious about it, you know. I knew exactly what he was talking about. It's exactly what I preached yesterday, didn't I? Yes, here, here in my heart, I know that he is the shepherd of my soul. My question to you this morning, I'm sure most of you probably know the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my, I shall not. And if, the, tru, listen, if truly the Lord is your shepherd in your heart, man, you will never want because he'll become your ever becoming one. That's what that name means. The I am, the tetragrammaton of God, the I am means he is, I am, I am whatever you need me to be. I am. I'm your ever-becoming one. Is he your shepherd, man? Do you know him in your heart? There are four who are going to declare that this morning in the back. I pray you have already. But if you've never been baptized, if you've never really surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not that you accept him. Mm -mm. He will accept you if you offer yourself to him. If you're new here, did, they, did you miss the collection plate? Did they not pass the plates? We don't pass the plate here, do we? We never have, have we? No. Why don't we pass the plate? God will take nothing from you. He receives what you offer him. Do you understand the difference? The false shepherds, they take. They take. And they take. And this third offering this morning is for the parking lot. <laughs> you, you be... No, we, listen, we take nothing from you. God receives what you offer him. And what is it you should be offering him? Your heart, everything, everything. Pastor David, you got a closing song? And I'll meet you out in the back. Shall we stand?